Chapter 1 Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Transsexualism There are many questions that people often ask about transsexualism. When was the first transsexual operation performed? Where was it done? How did transsexualism first gain public recognition? What is the cost of the surgery? How, medically speaking, is a person transsexed? What are the legal ramifications of sex conversion surgery? Is it possible to change birth certificates, driver's licenses, and the like? Has transsexualism been a phenomenon throughout history? Transsexual operations have been surgically possible since the early 1930s. The hormonal and surgical techniques, however, were not refined and made public until the early 1950s. Since then, thousands of transsexual operations have been performed both here and abroad, largely due to the support of individuals such as Harry Benjamin, MD, and institutions such as the Erickson Educational Foundation and Johns Hopkins. Transsexual treatment and surgery has become a legitimate medical area of research and activity. The medical specialties that it calls forth, or more correctly, that call it forth, are varied and complex, beginning with hormone therapy and often ending in numerous operative procedures. Just as complicated are the legal intricacies of changing sex on birth certificates, licenses, and other certificates of personhood required to live one's life. Other legal issues also affect the institutions performing the surgery. As a medical category that enlists many surgical specialties, and as a transformed state of being that requires legal validation, transsexualism is a relatively new phenomenon. Historical antecedents are found in certain mythological accounts, initiation rites, and certain modes of eunuchism and castration, but strictly speaking, transsexualism has no historical precedent. Recent History The word transsexualism did not become part of the English language until the early 1950s. It was invented as a medical term by Dr. D. O. Caldwell, who used it to classify a girl whom he described as obsessively wanting to be a boy. He called her condition psychopathia transsexualis. Several years later, in 1953, Harry Benjamin used the English word transsexualism in a lecture before the New York Academy of Medicine. Before 1967, the Index Medicus, did not list it as a subject heading. Prior to this, it was subsumed under such categories as transvestism and sex deviation. However, before the publication of the famed Christine Jorgensen case in 1953, most people had never heard of the word nor of the state of being that the word signified. Christine, formerly George Jorgensen was transsexed in Denmark in 1952 by a team of Danish physicians headed by Christian Hamburger. Their findings were published a year after the operation in the Journal of the American Medical Association with the consent of Jorgensen. In 1967, Jorgensen wrote about her own experiences in her autobiography. However, the first book to relate the probable case of transsexualism in a popular scientific style and content was Niels Hoyer's Man into Woman, 1933. The fact that the introduction to this book was written by a well-known British sexologist, Norma Hare, gave Hoyer's book a certain scientific credibility. The book is a story of a male Danish painter who became Lily Elba after several rather obscure operations. Although Christian Hamburger has been credited with bringing together many of the surgical specialties for the treatment of the transsexual, he was not the first physician to perform transsexual surgery. This title belongs to a German, F. Z. Abraham, who, in 1931, 
reported the first case of sex conversion surgery. In the years between 1931 and 1952, sporadic and piecemeal reports of transsexual operations came forth, primarily from Germany and Switzerland. Hamburger, for example, seems to have been the first to make use of hormonal castration and to follow up on his patients. At the time Jorgensen was transsexed, there were few places where one could go to obtain such surgery. Casablanca, Istanbul, and countries such as Denmark, Germany, and Switzerland were the most frequent locations to which transsexuals traveled provided they could pay the cost and were willing to risk little or no medical follow-up. Today, however, the situation, at least in the United States, is quite different. In the late 1950s, Dr. Harry Benjamin of New York, funded by grants from the Erickson Educational Foundation, began treating transsexuals and publicizing his research, hoping for professional and public understanding of what he entitled the transsexual phenomenon. Benjamin is the key American figure who aroused the interest of medical and psychological professionals especially in the problems of the transsexual. With the founding of the Harry Benjamin Foundation in 1964, he brought together a group of professionals from many specialties to do systemic research on transsexualism. This research took the form of batteries of tests, studies of transsexuals' sexual attitudes, and pre- and post-operative evaluations. A major expansion of transsexual research and activity took place in 1967 with the formal opening of the Johns Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic in Baltimore, Maryland. The fact that a major medical institution with the prestige of Johns Hopkins had initiated a clinic of this nature catapulted transsexualism into the public and professional eye as a legitimate medical problem. It was not until Johns Hopkins began performing the surgery and had initiated its gender identity center that sex conversion operations gained acceptance and were begun in other respected medical institutions. When Benjamin began his work in this country, there was no reputable hospital in America that would have permitted transsexual surgery. Now, post Johns Hopkins, there are estimated to be at least 30 such hospitals, among them university hospitals at Minnesota, Stanford, Northwestern, Arkansas, Michigan, Kentucky, and Virginia. The Johns Hopkins Clinic has served as a model for others of the same nature. It consists of a team of psychiatrists, psychologists, plastic surgeons, gynecologists, urologists, and endocrinologists. It works in close concert with certain legal and religious professionals who are called in to offer relevant advice. The team has also devised methods of evaluating preoperative transsexuals to judge their candidacy for surgery and operate selectively on those individuals who meet the criteria. It continues to review criteria mainly to determine whether surgery is warranted in all claims of transsexualism. It also continues to refine its methods of surgical treatment and attempts to do systematic post-operative follow-ups. Various team members, individually and in concert, have published many articles about their work and are regarded as being in the forefront of transsexual research. Of all persons who have been engaged in this work at Johns Hopkins, John Money, now Professor of Medical Psychology and Pediatrics at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, has been the foremost publicist of the transsexual phenomenon. Since 1967, many so-called gender identity clinics for transsexuals have been established in various parts of the country. Some are directly associated with university hospitals where surgery is done, while others, separated physically from any hospital base, counsel transsexuals, start hormone treatments, and eventually make selective referrals of candidates to medical personnel who then proceed with the surgery. Although reports conflict as to how many transsexual operations have actually been performed in this country and how many persons seek surgery, 
Figures published in Newsweek magazine on November 22, 1976, indicated that there are about 3,000 transsexuals in the U.S. who have undergone surgery and 10,000 more who view themselves as members of the opposite sex. Because more Americans want surgery than are accepted by those hospitals performing it, many transsexuals have probably continued to seek such surgery abroad. In the spring of 1973, the Erickson Foundation newsletter reported that only 10% of those individuals who go through evaluation for surgery eventually achieve it. It is very difficult to obtain exact professional statistics concerning the number of preoperative and or postoperative transsexuals. Various figures are given at times, but they often conflict. Zelda Supley, former director of the Erickson Educational Foundation and present head of the Janus Information Facility at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, has attested to this lack of vital statistics on transsexualism. Money and Walker also confirmed this lack of statistics in a recent book review in which they state, in the absence of any national directory of sex reassignment applicants, data on patients for surgery are inconclusive. Thus, the nature of the incidence of transsexual activity is not clear. This lack of data is very significant in light of the fact that other major surgery statistics seem readily available. With respect to the cost, the various procedures and in surgery involved differ from hospital to hospital. On the average, the male to constructed female operation and hospital stay alone can cost from 3000 to 6000 The female to constructed male operation involves a series of several operations before the results are achieved and cost up to $12,000. There are, of course, many other expenses besides the surgery and hospital bills. For male transsexuals, electrolysis to remove a heavy beard or stubble can cost as much as the surgery. Although many medical insurance policies do not cover the cost of surgery on the grounds that such surgery is cosmetic, many others consider it reconstructive and therapeutic measure and will pay for it. In some states, Blue Cross and Blue Shield will finance the surgery. In other areas, for example, New York City, courts have ruled that transsexual operations are to be included in medical assistance provided by the city and state for persons on welfare. In New Jersey, Medicaid payments have been authorized in some cases. Since federal funds that had been allocated for abortions have recently been withdrawn, Feminists are struck by the inequity of the situation. To paraphrase Jimmy Carter, life has been fair to transsexuals. A male problem. While it is clear that more men than women request and obtain sex conversion surgery, various ratios have been cited by researchers. The lowest ratio of women to men, 1 to 8, was reported by Benjamin in 1966. This was based on his own clinical experience with 152 cases of male transsexualism and 20 cases of female transsexualism. The highest ratio, 1 to 2, was reported by John Randall in 1959. Most reports fall between these two. According to international medical literature, the generally accepted ratio is 1 to 3 or 1 to 4. Recently, it has been claimed that the incidence of female to constructed male transsexualism is rising. Canon Clinton Jones of the Hartford Gender Identity Clinic and Dr. John Money of Johns Hopkins both mentioned this increase to me in personal interviews with them. Both said that they had seen during the early 70s almost as many women as men seeking surgery. However, the number of operations performed on men is still substantially higher. It is significant that the supposed increase has not been verified in print with the exception of a somewhat vague reference made by Dr. Ankh Erhard in a commentary on the article, Transsexualism and Surgical Procedures, in which she states, more and more females appear in doctor's offices and seek hormone and surgical treatment. What actual number, more and more, 
specifically refers to is, of course, anyone's guess. Zelda Supley stated that from her personal contact with would-be transsexuals, the preponderance is still male to constructed female. In my own interview sampling, I talk with only two female to constructed male transsexuals. Often, when I was given a female to constructed male contact, I had great difficulty finding the person. It is reasonable to speculate that the extreme difficulty I had in finding female to constructed male transsexuals, plus the scant mention of them in the literature, may be indicative of the fact that there are fewer of them than are claimed. Christian Hamburger gives us the more commonly claimed ratio of 1 to 3. He cites the letters he received and continues to receive in the aftermath of the famed Christian Jorgensen case. Hamburger believes that the reason for this 1 to 3 ratio may be biological in nature, whatever this may mean. He also stated that a contributing factor may also be that the case we reported involved a change from man into woman. John Money, however, has suggested that the preponderance of male transsexuals reflect the fact that men are more vulnerable to psychosexual disorders than are women. A similar view held that it may be that transsexualism, like other forms of sexual variations, is actually more frequent in the male than in the female and thus is in keeping with Kinsey's hypothesis that the male is more prone to conditioning by psychological stimuli in the sexual and gender sphere than is the female. There are many reasons male to constructed female transsexualism is more predominant. Most obviously, the surgery is easier, less costly, and more developed and publicized. Second, but perhaps less obvious, is the fact that men have been much freer to experiment than women. Thus, even in the area of transsexual treatment and surgery, it seems that men who desire to become female and to live out the gender role that is culturally prescribed for women are actually, in their assertiveness of seeking out and enduring the surgery, conforming much more to the masculine stereotype. Women, through a cultural conditioning that has generated less impulse to experiment, are likely to be much more reticent. Third, Male transsexualism may well be a graphic expression of the destruction that sexual molding has wrought on men. Thus, it could be perceived as one of the few outlets for men in a rigidly gender-defined society to opt out of their culturally prescribed roles. Women, on the other hand, since the rise of feminism, have been able to confront sexual oppression on a socio-political as well as personal level. Thus, women have realized that both masculine and feminine identities and roles are traps. Fourth, transsexual surgery is a creation of men, initially developed for men. The research and literature is overwhelmingly oriented to the male to constructed female transsexual and also overwhelmingly authored by men. I do not mean to say that women are not writing in the transsexual literature, are not working in the gender identity clinics, are not counseling transsexuals, or are not becoming transsexuals. It must be acknowledged that women are present in token proportions in all these various areas. Many even happen to be in the foreground, directing gender identity clinics and co-authoring writings on the topic. However, I would suggest that those women who are engaged in transsexual legitimation, writing, and counseling are functioning as tokens who promote the illusion of comprehensive female inclusion. In this respect, they are like the well-publicized women who are always present in some way to validate male-defined realities. Women who write in support of transsexualism are usually co-authors, Ankh Earhart, Patricia Tucker, and female counselors of transsexuals are women who, for the most part, assist in the gender identity clinics. Thus, the androcentric origin, control, maintenance, and legitimation of transsexualism becomes obscured. The fact that the overwhelming research interests, number of publications, and medical state of the art are considered with male to constructed female transsexualism is also evidence of the male-centered nature of the transsexual phenomenon. The female to constructed male transsexual is the token that saves face for the male transsexual empire. 
She is the buffer zone who can be used to promote the universalist argument that transsexualism is a supposed human problem, not uniquely restricted to men. She is the living proof that some women supposedly want the same thing. However, proof wanes when it is observed that women were not the original, nor are they the present agents of the process. Nor are the stereotypes of masculinity that a female to constructed male transsexual incarnates products of a female directed culture. Rather, women have been assimilated into the transsexual world as women are assimilated into other male defined worlds, institutions, and roles, that is, on men's terms and thus as tokens. As Judith Long Laws has written, Tokenism may be analyzed as an institution, a form of patterned activity generated by a social system as a means of adaptation to a particular kind of pressure. I would maintain that under the pressure of having to demonstrate that transsexualism is really not limited to men, the medical empire assimilates female to constructed male transsexuals, but always on its own terms. The token is a member of an underrepresented group who is operating on the turf of the dominant group, under license from it. In tokenism, the flow of outsiders into the dominant group is usually restricted numerically, but just enough so that the illusion of inclusion takes place. This is exactly what happens with transsexuals. The accepted 4 to 1 ratio of male to constructed females seeking and achieving transsexual status is enough to register the appearance of sufficient inclusion of women. Further, the token female presence in all aspects of the transsexual world is enough for the transsexual experts to claim that transsexualism is sex blind. Yet it is most important to note here that tokenism, as Mary Daly has pointed out, is not merely a matter of numerical restriction. For example, the United States Senate could be composed of 50% women, and these women senators could still be tokens if their consciousness in legislation were still controlled by a patriarchal ethos. If they did not initiate and legitimate activities, and if they did not have a controlling power. Thus, if the included group is not the controller of its own ethos, and the initiator or legitimator of action, no matter how numerically present it may be, it is still a token group. Six million Jews could go to their death in Nazi camps, not because there were too few of them, but because they were not in control and thus their numbers were impotent. In the same way, the percentage of female to constructed male transsexuals could be numerically increased to the extent where they would equal men. Yet, if they were still being transsexed by a transsexual empire whose social and body stereotypes were conceived by men, they would still be tokens. Part of the syndrome of tokenism is to make women seem important. John Money, whose work will be discussed in chapter two, is very careful to co-author his articles and books with a woman. It is an irony that women are getting authorship credit in the area of transsexualism when they have gotten so little credit in other fields for what work they have really initiated. A fifth reason why more men want to be women than women men can be hazarded from other feminist analyses of biomedical issues. Simply put, it is that men recognize the power that women have by virtue of female biology. And the fact that this power, symbolized in giving birth, is not only procreative, but multidimensionally creative. Various observers have called this recognition by various names. Karen Horney reversed Freud's theory of penis envy, calling it womb envy. Ralph Greenson, in an address to a clinical meeting of the AMA, gave this interesting analysis. It is horrifying, a danger to the future of the human race. Our only hope is that basic instincts will eventually win out, that a true equality of the sexes will emerge. Always before people thought it was the woman who envied the man, 
but we have found that more than two-thirds of those who wanted to change their gender were males. What is shocking is that this is more widespread than was believed. These people are not psychotic. They are not crackpots. Men have contempt for women only on the surface. Underneath is a repressed envy. A repressed envy arouses fear. One reason the male envies the woman so much is that she is always sure of herself as a woman. A man is quite never sure he is a man. He has to prove it over and over again. Barbara Seaman and others have called this kind of envy and desire male mothering. Barbara Ehrenreich and Deirdre English, in their groundbreaking works on the history of medicine in the West, discuss the same phenomenon on a more political level when they talk about the male takeover of women's healing functions, especially during the medieval and reformation periods, the obliteration of the witch midwife, and the modern period, the consolidation of orthodox medicine, particularly in this country. Transsexualism can be viewed as one more androcentric interventionist procedure along with male-controlled cloning, test tube fertilization, and sex selection technology, it tends to wrest from women those powers inherent in female biology. In a very real sense, the male to constructed female transsexual not only wants female biological capacities, but wants to become the biological female. Finally, and I think most important, there are more male to constructed female transsexuals because men are socialized to fetishize and objectify. The same socialization that enables men to objectify women in rape, pornography, and drag enables them to objectify their own bodies. In the case of the male transsexual, the penis is seen as a thing to be gotten rid of. Female body parts, specifically the female genitalia, are things to be acquired. Men have always fetishized women's genitalia. Breasts, legs, buttocks are all parts of a cultural fixation that reduces women, not even to a whole objectified nude body, but rather to fetishized parts of the female torso. The Venus de Milo symbolizes this as well as the fact that it has never been restored to its original integrity. Cunt, ass, getting one's rocks off, Balling are all sexist slogans of this fetishized worldview where even chicks and broads are reduced to the barest essentials. Male to constructed female transsexualism is only one more relatively recent variation on this theme where the female genitalia are completely separated from the biological woman and, through surgery, come to be dominated by incorporation into the biological man. Transsexualism is thus the ultimate, and we might even say the logical, conclusion of male possession of women in a patriarchal society. Literally, men here possess women. Definitions of fetishism are revealing in this context. Webster's Dictionary defines fetish in several ways. First, as an object believed among the primitive people to have magical power to protect or aid its owner. Broadly, a material object regarded with superstitious or extravagant trust or reverence, an object of irrational reverence or obsessive devotion, an object or bodily part whose real or fantasized presence is psychologically necessary for sexual gratification and that is an object of fixation to the extent that it may interfere with complete sexual expression. Second, as a rite or cult of fetish worshippers. Third, fetish is simply defined as fixation. From these definitions, it is clear that the process of fetishization has two sides. Objectification, in what might be referred to as worship in the widest sense, Objectification is largely accomplished by a process of fragmentation. The fetish is the fragmented part taken away from the whole, or better, the fetish is seen to contain the whole. 
it represents an attempt to grasp the whole. For example, breasts and legs in our society are fetish objects containing the essence of femaleness. Thus, the fetish contains and by containing controls. However, the other side of fetishization is worship or reverence for the fetish object. In primitive religion, fetish objects were worshipped because people were afraid of the power they were seen to contain. Therefore, primitive peoples sought to control the power of the fetish by worshipping it, and in doing so, they confined it to its rightful place. There was a recognition of a power that people felt they lacked, and a constant quest in ceremonies and cults to invest themselves with the power of the fetish object. Thus, to worship was also to control. In this way, objectification and worship are two sides of the same coin. In this sense, transsexualism is a fetishization par excellence, a twisted recognition on the part of some men of creative capacities of the female spirit as symbolized. This usurpation of female biology, of course, is limited to the artifacts of female biology. Silicone breast implants, exogenous estrogen therapy, artificial vaginas, etc., that modern medicine has surgically and hormonally created. Thus, transsexual fetishization is further limited not even to the real parts of the real whole, but to the artifactual parts of the artifactual whole. In summary, then, since men have been socialized to fetishize women, it is not surprising that this fetishization process is one more explanation of why there are more male to constructed female transsexuals. What could be perceived as an initial protest against sexual stereotyping, i.e. the transsexual's initial gender discomfort and gender rebellion, becomes short-circuited. The Medicalized Female the medical procedures involved in transsexualism are puzzling to laypersons. Most cannot begin to imagine what is physically involved in changing sex or how the change is accomplished. The medical odyssey of the transsexual is a long one, often beginning years before surgery is completed. For men, it usually starts with the administration of the female hormones estrogen and progesterone. This is referred to as hormonal castration. Hormonal treatment has two effects. It suppresses the existing physiological sex characteristics and it develops and maintains the opposite anatomical sex characteristics. Benjamin explains, The feminization of the male patient can be accomplished by female hormones, both estrogen and progesterone, which develop the breasts, soften the skin, reduce body hair, diminish erections, decrease libidinous conflict by suppressing testicular androgen production. In addition, the gonads are inhibited, the testes atrophy, the distribution of subcutaneous fat is changed in a female direction, and muscular strength diminishes. Very often, however, beard growth diminishes only slightly, and other areas of male hair growth also remain generally unchanged. For this reason, many transsexuals resort to electrolysis. As far as voice is concerned, there is little change. Hormones are administered in various ways. For men, the estrogens of 17-beta-estradiol and estrone can be given orally. Estradiol monobenzoate, another estrogen, can be injected intramuscularly twice a week. Numerous artificial compounds with estrogenic activity have also been synthesized for oral administration besides the steroids. DES, diethylstilbesterol, for example, has been widely used. Estrogenic hormones can also be applied as ointments or alcoholic solutions and absorbed through the skin. Estradiol, in combination with progesterone, 
has also been administered in the form of rectal suppositories. The treatment of male transsexual candidates is almost totally dependent on estrogen to induce hormonal castration and feminization. Such treatment is a long-term, in many cases, lifelong. The next step is the surgery itself, which requires the combined techniques of the urologist, gynecologist, and the plastic surgeon. The total procedure takes place in four steps, although all of them may or may not be desired by a particular patient. The four steps are penectomy, castration, plastic reconstruction, and the formation of an artificial vagina, vaginoplasty. Some transsexuals have only the first and second steps performed, and indeed some writers recommend this approach. The vagina is constructed by creating a cavity between the prostate and the rectum. An artificial vagina is formed from a skin graft from the thigh and lined with penile and or scrotal skin. Thus, orgasmic sensation is possible. The shape of the artificial vagina is maintained by a mold that is worn continuously for several weeks following surgery. Once healing has occurred, manual dilation or penile insertion two or three times weekly is necessary to prevent narrowing, which can result through the contraction of scar tissue. The next most common procedure is enlarging the breast, usually with inserted implants. This is often followed up with increased estrogen therapy. However, two cases of breast cancer that occurred about five years after such treatment have been reported. The author suggests that the malignancy was entirely due to the hormonal imbalance created by excessive estrogen therapy and orchidectomy removal of one or both testes. Leo Wolman has commented, the degree of risk may well be a function of the amount of hormone use. The most likely possibility is that the hormonally feminized male transsexual conservatively treated with estrogen runs the same risk of breast malignancy as does a normal female. However, in light of the recent evidence about estrogen replacement therapy and also evidence linking cancer and birth control pills, Wolman's position is hardly reassuring. Normal women, even on conservative doses of estrogen therapy, run a great risk of incurring cancer. Following surgery, transsexuals receive oral maintenance doses of estrogen, thus becoming medically managed individuals. Usually, this treatment is administered bi-weekly, although longer intervals do occur. The hormones used are the same as those given preoperatively. Such hormones are said to play an important role in general metabolism, particularly with regard to bones, skin, blood vessels, and muscles. Interestingly, it has been said that without these hormones, postoperative patients would experience climacteric symptoms, including hot flashes and deterioration of general body tone. These are, of course, the classic menopausal symptoms. It is now seriously suggested, in the light of evidence linking estrogen replacement therapy and cancer, that such symptoms, if indeed they are really experienced by women, could be best treated by other means e.g. calcium and phosphorus replacement to prevent bone deterioration. Surgery, however, often does not end with vaginal construction. Secondary operations are often sought by the transsexual, usually for aesthetic reasons and or to correct real or psychologically felt complications. This cosmetic surgery frequently has nothing to do with the refashioning of the genitalia themselves, it ranges from limb surgery to eye surgery, chin surgery, ear surgery, scar revision, and even tattoo excision. Some transsexuals also seek reduction of the Adam's apple. All these procedures are undertaken by the transsexual 
in the hope of conforming more to the fashionable, stereotypical feminine body image. Many transsexuals go to great lengths to fit themselves to the prescribed body measurements and gestalt of a man-made woman. Surgery to correct complications centers on the breast and genitalia. Bleeding can be a problem in the breast area and care must be taken to control this completely. Otherwise, post-operative hematoma can occur. Also, the lack of overlying breast tissue covering an implant offers little protection from even the slightest injury. The breast is vulnerable to injury that may cause subsequent expulsion of the prosthesis, again requiring corrective surgery. As far as the genitalia are concerned, correctional problems can occur here also. It has been reported that surgical complications are not common, but the most recurrent ones include narrowing of the vagina, rectovaginal fistulas, and narrowing of the urethra. Overall, it has been said that the final external appearance of the genitalia varies not only from patient to patient, but with the surgical technique employed. Few patients are truly satisfied. Many seek further corrective changes. However, there is some conflicting evidence. On the one hand, Milton Egerton and his colleagues have reported that of nine patients operated on by their group, all were dissatisfied with the surgery. Although all stated that they would do it again. Conversely, Fogg Anderson reported in his series that most patients were satisfied with their surgery and did not regret having made the change. Several authors have commented on the surgical demands and needs of transsexuals. For example, the surgeon must be prepared to combat the tendency of these patients to desire polysurgery. This can be responded to in several ways. First of all, all transsexual surgery from the primary operative procedures through the secondary surgical adjustments and cosmetic procedures can be regarded as polysurgery or unnecessary surgery. Secondly, it is hard to see how the surgeon can be prepared to combat the tendency of these patients to desire polysurgery if the surgeons are the ones who are creating all the different varieties and kinds of polysurgery by developing the surgical specialties, which in turn create the demand. The medicalized male. The female to constructed male transsexual also begins sex conversion odyssey with hormone treatment. Androgen is injected to arrest menstruation, to stimulate some hair growth on the face and body, possibly to lower the voice slightly, and to accomplish some reduction of breast tissue. This also causes the muscle and body appearance in general to become progressively more masculine. Long-term administration of testosterone often increases the size of the clitoris. However, menstruation is not always suppressed by hormonal treatment. In some cases, radiation had to be used because breakthrough bleeding occurred after androgens were injected. In the medical literature, this is called radiation menopause. One of the ill effects of long-term androgen therapy has been attacks of acne, some observers also report a libido increase that they regard as undesirable and troublesome, but whether or not this is caused by biological or social psychological influences is debatable. One of the more serious consequences of androgen is that all of its effects are not always reversible. If a woman decides to stop hormone treatment, her voice may retain its low pitch and her facial hair may remain. Surgery involves several steps, all of which are not necessarily undertaken. 
mastectomy, hysterectomy, and orphorectomy, removal of the ovaries, are surgical procedures that most transsexuals undergo. As the penis is a constant reminder to the male transsexual of his rejected male body, so are breast and menstruation to the female. The female transsexual patient, perhaps considerably more than the male, feels quite strongly that something is wrong internally. The menses are regarded as loathsome and often are described as being exceedingly painful. Many patients will seek and perhaps obtain exploratory laparotomy and hysterectomy, firmly convinced that testes and other male organs will be discovered. Since testosterone causes only a moderate reduction of a woman's breast, female transsexuals usually obtain mastectomies. Hysterectories and the removal of the ovaries constitute the second step in female to constructed male transsexual surgery. The vagina remains. Phallus construction, when undertaken, begins in conjunction with a hysterectomy. It is technically possible to construct a penis surgically by rotating a tube flap of skin from the left lower quadrant of the abdomen and closing the vaginal orifice. A urinary conduit can be led through such a phallus so that the constructed penis may be used for urination. However, because of complications, many surgeons have decided against constructing the phallus so it can be used to urinate. Instead, the female urethra is maintained in its existing position beneath the constructed penis. But the new penis lacks sensitivity and can become erect only through the insertion of certain stiffening material that remains in the penis at all times or can be put in and out through an opening in its skin. Many female to constructed male transsexuals, however, stop after obtaining hormone therapy, mastectomy, and hysterectomy, feeling that they do not wish to undergo the multi-stage procedures required for the construction of a phallus which is often also accompanied by scrotal construction. Some transsexuals recognize that the phallus will serve little, if any, role in sexual activity, since the technique of creating an erect penis has not been developed. Some female transsexuals, however, do undergo the number of hospitalizations required for phallus construction. They are convinced that the rod-like stiffener inserted into the skin of the constructed member can put pressure on the original clitoris, which still remains, during intercourse, making an orgasm possible. Therefore, some transsexuals are willing to endure the multiple procedures that are necessary for this. One female to constructed male transsexual underwent 33 plastic surgery operations to obtain a satisfactory penis. Furthermore, the fear of discovery becomes a strong pressure, pushing both male and female transsexuals to undergo every possible kind of surgery. All transsexuals express profound anxiety about being placed in an uncontrolled environment through accident or illness and thereby being unmasked. For the female to constructed male transsexual, Toilet trauma, as Zelda Zupli calls it, is a particular fear. Public lavatory facilities for men often require the kind of exposure that women do not meet, and this alone increases the female transsexual's anxiety about phallus construction. The legal landscape. Problems for the transsexual, however, are not limited to the medical surgical realm. For most transsexuals, there are legal difficulties that must also be resolved and corresponding legal journey that must be traveled. In fact, the legal odyssey for most transsexuals begins long before the operation takes place. Legally, there are many constraints on the transsexual 
and on both the institution and the doctors performing the operation. In addition, there are several state statutes that have been evoked against preoperative transsexuals who have been caught in the act of cross-dressing. Many of these same statutes have been used against transvestites and in some cases against homosexuals in the past. Section 887, Subdivision 7 of the New York State Code of Criminal Procedure is typical of some state female impersonation statutes that have been used in the past against transvestites and homosexuals and are now being invoked against transsexuals. Although the preoperative transsexual is not having sexual relations at the time of arrest, nor attempting to solicit or defraud as a female, he is arrested on the grounds of masquerading as a female. In such situations, the transsexual has often presented medical certification attesting to his transsexual status and has still been arrested and convicted under the statute. Furthermore, doctors have been warned against issuing such certification on the grounds that such documents might be judged illegal and or improper medical conduct by the local unsympathetic medical association. In many states, there is no hesitation on the part of the police to arrest under a disorderly conduct statute. This is done despite the fact that the transsexual was in no way being disorderly at the time of arrest and does not perpetuate the unusual acts, crowd gathering, loud commotion, etc., that cause disorderly conduct arrest. Various catch all statutes are also invoked. Under these statutes, persons can be taken into legal custody for the acts that outrage public decency and for which there are no other specific and covering statutes. Thus, catch-all statutes make it very difficult to predict what kind of behavior is defined as criminal, and they leave much discretion to the arresting officer. Under catch-all statutes, transvestite, homosexual, and transsexual persons have been frequently arrested, and many have been jailed, convicted, and fined. Legal difficulties are not solved for the transsexual even after sex conversion surgery has taken place. The post-operative transsexual in many states faces long legal battles in trying to change personal papers. Some states have been quick to grant such changes, others have been more gradual, and some have refused altogether. In many areas, transsexuals and their advocates have asked the courts to define sex and to thereby set a precedent for other legal decisions on the matter. Johns Hopkins Hospital followed a fundamentally different procedure. The medical community there took the initiative on behalf of their clients to guide the city and state in setting an administrative precedent for birth certificate changes. In 1967, one of the Johns Hopkins gender identity committee members spoke with an official of Baltimore's Bureau of Vital Statistics. This official allowed that the name on a transsexual's birth certificate could be amended and also that the sex could be changed to conform to the new legal name. A shortened birth certificate with only new information on it was then issued to the transsexual. The old certificate with emendation was kept in a sealed envelope on record and could be produced if necessary to ensure continuity of legal identity, which might be needed for the purposes of proving past schooling, social security, and inheritance rights. Most of the transsexuals' everyday needs would be met by the short form certificate carrying no evidence of sex reassignment. With respect to the surgery itself, there are several statutes that may be invoked against both transsexuals and the institution that performs the operation. Looming largest is the threat of legal mutilation. 
which is embodied in so-called mayhem statutes, still on the books in majority of states. These statutes forbid the willful and permanent deprivation, crippling, and or mutilation of a bodily organ. They could be used to prosecute the transsexual who undergoes sex conversion surgery, the surgeons performing the operation, and the institution in which the operation is done. Surgeons have been warned by district attorney's offices throughout the country of impending prosecution under this law when they have inquired about the legality of transsexual surgery. In contrast to the risk of criminal liability, a physician may also be exposed to liability in tort if the individual's consent to the operation should be declared invalid. A case in Argentina ruled that a transsexual's consent to sex conversion surgery was unnatural and therefore invalid, and the surgeon became liable in tort for assault. In the United States, however, where no such legal decisions have been rendered concerning the operation itself, the institutions that are performing such operations have followed various legal courses. With a mayhem statute hovering over it, the UCLA Medical Center decided not to initiate such operations on their own, but instead asked the law if it can find some legal precedent to guide them. One of the university's legal advisors cautioned against what he termed a legally risky surgical venture. Thus, the UCLA Gender Identity Clinic presently performs sex conversion surgery only on those individuals who have definite and provable biological sexual anomalies. A second group of medical personnel at the University of Minnesota acted similarly to the UCLA team in asking the law for guidance in this area. However, the absence of a mayhem statute in the state of Minnesota was the key factor that encouraged its decision to proceed with transsexual operations. Had they been faced with the presence of a mayhem statute, it is likely that the Minnesota group might have followed UCLA's course. Strikingly different from the preceding two cases is that of the Johns Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic. This group, instead of asking the law for guidance, as we noted previously in the birth certificate situation, again set a precedent for the law to look to. When the case of GL, a 17-year-old boy, arose and transsexual surgery was sought by the boy and his parents, the specialists involved, confident of their medical decision about sex reassignment surgery for the boy, proceeded on the basis of their own medical judgment. The boy, the boy's parents, his probation officer, the boy had been involved in repeated delinquencies supposedly linked to sexual dissatisfaction with his body. Two specialists from the Hopkins Clinic and a judge joined together to form a liaison among the petitioners, medicine, and the law in the event that the sex conversion should be challenged in the future. Furthermore, the judge signed a court order for the surgery. This court order was set no legal precedent unless challenged by a higher court, but the very act of procuring a court order placed the whole procedure within the scope of the law. The judge himself attended several meetings of the Johns Hopkins Gender Identity Committee and said he would be available should his advice be needed. This, of course, is a highly unusual procedure. The university's lawyer also worked closely with the team, discussing various legal issues with them and advising them on such aspects as consent and legal name changes. Thus, confrontation between law and medicine was avoided so that no lawyer or judge would be put in the position of interpreting Hopkins' policy. Acting on the basis of professional judgment, the Hopkins Medical Group defined the problem as a medical one and acted accordingly, getting the law to affirm its judgment. In assessing the legal position of the transsexual, 
various factors come into play. First of all, it can be demonstrated that statutes invoked against preoperative transsexual who cross-dresses are plainly unjust, not applicable, or too widely construed to be legitimately enforced. Section 887, Subdivision 7, of the New York State Code of Criminal Procedure is a case in point. The statute expressly forbids female impersonation, but should only be invoked when impersonation is used to defraud or solicit. As Robert Sherwin has stated, there is no law that expressly forbids males to wear female clothing per se. There are laws that forbid males from doing so for the purposes of defrauding when, for example, one tries to gain illegal entry or attempts to acquire money by such impersonation. However, the statute has not been adhered to and wide discretionary powers are given to arresting officers. Arresting officers in some states have used also a wide and broadly applied disorderly conduct statute or other catch-all statutes to pull cross-dressers off the street or out of public and even private places. Given the latitude of application here, such statutes should be revised or eliminated altogether. Impersonation statutes should be invoked precisely for the purposes they were intended, i.e. to stop fraud. Disorderly conduct should include only obvious disorderly conduct. Transvestism cannot of itself be demonstrated to be disorderly conduct. At this point, the causes of transsexualism need to be examined. The medical and psychological literature has focused on two areas, prenatal critical hormonal factors that supposedly set the direction but not the extent of sex differences, and two, individual and family influences that are claimed to condition transsexual development. Both theories warrant a close examination, yet, as I shall argue, both neglect the wider a more primary influence of sex role stereotyping in a patriarchal society and both ultimately conclude by blaming the mother.